SQL has been around for an incredibly long time. Sadly, it hasn't been challenged meaningfully. Well, kind of. We've had solutions like DynamoDB and even things like Mongo that have went really far out of the relational direction saying, hey, we can be way faster if we just store data and you call it by key. There are lots of solutions that have leaned out of the idea of relational models and into this idea of just storing data, but no one's really went past what SQL did. If you had SQL in the middle and you had Mongo and Dynamo on one side, we never really had something on the other side. We never saw people meaningfully challenging how could we be more relational. There have been some experiments with fetching data in graphs like a dgraph back in the day, but not enough. That is kind of starting to change. But before we talk about that change, I need to do two important disclosures. First, the company we're about to talk about is a company that I've been advising on and off for like a year now. The founder is a good friend. He was one of the first people to see what I was doing on YouTube and reach out. And as such, I've been impressed with what they're doing and excited to help out where I can. The second thing is I'm not actually using EdgeDB on any projects yet. Normally when I'm talking about these things, I have done my due diligence and went deep in using and shipping the product, especially when it's coming to things like my channel sponsors. These guys are not a sponsor. They're not paying me to talk about this. I'm under no obligation to do such. I just want to share it because I'm genuinely interested. So those are my disclosures. Those are my disclaimers. Yes, if they succeed, I get a bit of a payday. But if they fail, which statistically speaking, they will, not a big deal at all. So I just wanted to show you guys why I think they're cool and what they're doing. Welcome to EdgeDB, a future past sequel. I, I, Okay, one more small disclaimer, I wrote this. Anyways, let's face it, SQL is not good enough. We wanted a database with hierarchical queries, advanced data modeling, and great DX. There were none, so we built EdgeDB, based on Postgres and 100% open source. It's become so much more. And yes, that's an important detail, it is 100% open source. Not the bullshit upload thing style open source where all the code you run is open source and all the code we run is not. Proper, full, true, open source. N plus one solved. This, I, I love this example because it shows just how different the experience is querying complex data inside of EdgeQL in, in EdgeDB based thing. Also, one more thing before I mention it, EdgeDB has nothing to do with the edge. So the idea of edge compute, of distributed locations, all of those things, nothing to do with any of it. It's a terrible name. I've been telling the founder for a long time, it should be renamed. It's probably too late now. Yeah, EdgeDB is the wrong name for this database. So ignore that part. So here's the comparison I wanted to showcase. Here we have a pretty traditional SQL query where we have, we wanna select all of these actors' names from movies and then also include the mean score from the reviews. So this in SQL kind of sucks. We just select the movie title, then we have to make a sub-selection where we select the average rating from reviews where the ID matches as average rating. And we also have to select from the aggregate from person name, as V from actor, yeah, no, this is, this is why people think SQL is hard because shit like this is normal if you want to use SQL right. They even have a drizzle example, which I love that they did this and they did this properly too, where we have the DB select ID using the movie ID, average rating from schema reviews, group by this, where these things are equal, prepare movie rating. Then we have the movie query where we similarly find first. Also, all of these are separate queries, so these all have to run separately. You can wrap them in a transaction if you want them to, to run at once, but even then it's two different queries. You should you can probably understand how this code works, but it's chaos that you have to do all of these things. Versus in EdgeQL, you select movie, you want the title, you want the subfield actors, which is a mapping, a relational mapping with name, and then rating, which is assigned the math mean of the dot reviews dot score. Then you filter by the ID. That's it. Where things get even more fun is their TypeScript, because they are fully type safe and actually have been huge for me in better understanding the relationships between a query builder, a schema definition, and the connection layer that exists within your query tools. So yeah, here we have e.params where we have an ID that is a UUID and we use this dollar sign as like a helper throughout. e.select, e.movie, movie. We want the title, we want the actors with name true. Again, this is TypeScript. So if you pass e.movie and title doesn't exist, you'll get a type error here. Very handy. And then we're using this e edge db helper to do e.math.mean we just pass it the movie.reviews.score object that comes from this function here and we filter e.op movie id is equal to dollar sign dot id the dollar sign equal as the thing you pass here for the operation i initially hated but honestly i much prefer it now to the drizzle eq lt gt and the 15 plus imports you have to do in drizzle to do that type of math the idea of one helper that you just pass a string makes it more readable, consistent, and less chaotic to maintain. I actually really like the DX and the syntax here overall. I'm genuinely impressed. Another important piece is how hilariously fast it is. 
compared to other solutions in full stack. Whew. And this is with the fact that Drizzle's over twice as fast as Prisma. That's how you know these benchmarks are somewhat accurate because Prisma's hilariously slow compared to Drizzle. Then you see Edgy Beam, you're like, oh, oh, that's why you made this interesting. That did remind me of one other thing I want to call it before we go further. This based on Postgres, I pushed back on this being included here. I lean towards it not being spoken too loudly about because it's not based on Postgres in the sense that it's there for anyone to use. The same way with like upload thing, we are based on S3. But S3 is an implementation detail of how it works. You're not going to be querying this Postgres database that's underneath EdgeDB directly in any way, shape, or form. Postgres is just the thing that happens to store that data underneath. It is not meant to be a layer that you're actually competing with. It's just meant to, to be there, not to call, not to access, but to be the best base point for them to start building on top of. The Postgres here is an implementation detail. So don't pick this because it's Postgres. Pick this because it's an alternative to SQL that is built on top of existing well-trusted standards. But don't expect to get access to Postgres because you're using HDB. It doesn't work that way. They also suggest here that you can add latency to see how these things compare when you have much less latency between the backend and the DB, which is pretty cool. Here are some quotes, including mine. By the way, Guillermo is an early investor and pretty excited about EdgeDB as well. EdgeDB fixes fundamental flaws of SQL and legacy DBs and serverless, the perfect fit for Next and Vercel. It's a longtime hater of Mongo. I'm pumped to see a real challenger for SQL that goes the other direction. Relations are good. Yep. Yep. You get the idea. Good quotes. Oh, of course, David Kramer snuck his way in here too. The most high-tech companies in the world run graph architectures on top of SQL. Now you too can be high-tech. Hmm. <laughs> Clever. In the cloud. This is the big thing that they just launched too. The ability to spin up with their cloud in a free tier without having to host the database yourself. Up until recently, you actually had to host HDB yourself because they were so focused on the tech. They weren't focused on the hosting side. So you just run their Docker image wherever you wanted to. Now you can just use their cloud, which is very exciting. It means I'll actually probably try the product, which I probably wouldn't have before, if I'm being totally honest. God, this part's so cool. The idea of an iceberg visual to represent this is actually dope, and I love this. So the top level, they have the things that are obvious with a built-in UI, auth, and REG. I hate the built-in GraphQL. I, I have called them out so many times for this. It just it gives the wrong impression and doesn't get customers that you actually want. I, I don't think the built-in GraphQL is a good idea at all. The fact that they can store vectors seamlessly is dope. That's, again, great for the AI people. Effortless JSON. Yeah. Access policies are again annoying and a necessary evil when you have things like the built-in GraphQL and you're letting people use your database as a backend, which you shouldn't, but they should be tunneling. That's actually a really cool one. A tangent I want to go on is my own personal experience with EdgeDB. It helped me a lot in my understanding of the parts that exist in tools like this. So you see here, there's a lot of pieces. Before I played with and learned a bit more about EdgeDB, I was a big Prisma fan. But I didn't really understand the relationship between these parts of Prisma because it kind of just felt like one big thing. What I learned with EdgeDB, there is like roughly four core parts to the TypeScript experience around something like EdgeDB or even something like Keasley, Drizzle, or as I was saying before, Prisma. You have the client, which is the thing that actually connects to the database. You have the query builder, which is how you write the queries and do it in a way that's ergonomic in your language. You have the schema, which is the thing that actually defines what objects exist in your database. And then you have something that links the query builder to that definition, which is not easy to do. The way Prisma does this is there's a code gen step whenever you make a change in the Prisma file that generates new type definitions that override the Prisma type definitions in the actual Prisma node module. Yes, when you're running Prisma, that is a post install step where it rewrites a bunch of the type definitions in the node module based on your Prisma schema file, which is chaotic. And having all these things so tied together made it way more fragile and even made things like your build pipeline less reliable. EdgeDB was one of the first things I saw that properly separated these parts where you had the query builder, the client, the generator, and the schema all as separate pieces that had a relationship with each other, which was actually really nice and helped me understand how different those parts were. It also helped me appreciate what Drizzle was doing so much more when I saw how they were separating things and how they were actually acknowledging that these parts were different. And also with Drizzle, they moved the schema into your TypeScript so they didn't have to do a code gen step instead. EdgeDB still has code gen because EdgeDB is really focused on their own alternative schema and their schema is fucking dope. So I totally get why they would do that. If we hop over to their database section, we can see the schema definitions, which are really cool. Type movie, required title, string, required director, person, type person, required name, string. How cool is that? It just reads well. It's easy to work with. It feels like traditional TypeScript type defs, but now you can use the ESDL, the EdgeDB schema language 
schema definition language, I think what it stands for specifically. They even have VS Code and other, even Vim highlighting. Cool, awesome. The important piece is that you can generate type definitions based on this and then use those in the querier. When you're building queries and then hitting the client with those, you can use this as a source of information for all of that. Awesome. Everything should have something like this. I love what I'm doing with Drizzle and the type definitions and the schema being part of my TypeScript, but it's not as flexible as its own language. And I do kind of miss having something like the Prisma schema that lets you define it all in one place. So I'm hyped they went that way. And then again, you create the migrations and then actually run them. And then you generate the type definitions based on it. And it should be create client, main, await client to execute. And I was just writing this as a string here for the first demo. NPX HDB generate interfaces. This gives you movie in DB schema interfaces and other things too. So now you can await client.query single movie and do this here. I will say this is scary because you could probably, technically speaking, put a different type definition here than you're actually calling for here. It'd be very hard for them to type check that to be correct because the inference is based on what you put there. Regardless, nice. Where things get really fun though is when you're actually using a query builder. Like here, SGB create client e.select e.movie now it knows that from the schema that we've generated and everything behaves fully type safe with TypeScript syntax and behaviors as you would expect. Really cool. I love how they separated these things. I love how they called out how they separated these things. If you guys know uh, Colin McDowell, the creator of Zod, he was involved really early in helping shape these SDKs to make them as good as they are. It makes a lot of sense that this feels like writing TRPC in a lot of ways. Really cool stuff. Oh, another huge thing. No null. Oh. You look curious about the nulls, especially for things like sets. So here is the section, there is no null. There is no null value in EdgeDB, unlike in many other databases or programming languages. This is deliberate, as null scalars create all sorts of problems when introducing other data and operations. They have a whole blog post here. This is the, we can do better than SQL. I love this article. I should do a whole video about this. Let me know in the comments if you agree. Yeah, null, a bag of surprises. In some cases of inadequate handling of missing information, the problem is incorrectly perceived to be a problem of the relational model. In fact, the problem stems from inadequacies of SQL and its nonconformance to the relational model. It has been extensively argued that null is the biggest misfeature of SQL. Here's a bunch of citations from others talking all about that. In fact, the handling of null in contemporary SQL implementations is so surprising, inconsistent, and dangerous that this topic deserves a separate section. Null is so special that it's not equal to anything, including itself. Yeah, null does not equal null. <laughs> in fact, almost any operation on null will return null, and the effect may be very subtle. So if we have this insert into table that has A and B as the like two types, we're inserting values 1, 1, 2, 2, null, 3. We return A and B, 1, 2, 3, there. But then if we select from X where A is not in 1, comma, null, ugh, chaos. But in some cases, null is equal to itself, like in distinct. So you can't do distinct on a null because if there's multiple, it won't be distinct. But if you're trying to look for null, you can't do that either. <sighs> yeah, I, I have generally avoided these things because I just use an ORM when things get this complex, but uh, God, yeah. Much of the traditional logic and Boolean algebra rules cannot be safely applied to SQL Boolean expressions in the presence of null. For example, the law of excluded middle, P or not P, does not evaluate a true if P is null. <laughs> yeah, you get the idea. I'll be sure to link this in the description if you want to read more. But again, let me know in the comments why you do a whole video about it because it is really cool stuff. In Postgres, division by zero is an exception where in MySQL it returns null. <laughs> I hate this. Why, why did we let Sand think? It's been a mistake since. So their solution is instead of the null scalar value, EdgeDB uses an empty set to denote the absence of data. The advantage of using the empty set is that it works exactly like every other set in every way. Its behavior is well-defined and consistent across all operators and functions. For example, the count function, which returns the number of elements in a set, works just as well with an empty set. We run this, we get back zero, because there's nothing in the set. The exists operator returns false if the set is empty and true otherwise. Cool. Usually it is necessary to provide the type of empty set using a cast when the type is relevant and cannot be assumed. That makes sense too. If you're setting it to empty, you need to give it a type so we know when it's not empty what it will be. There's no in context to indicate the intended type of the empty set, so EdgeQL will not accept the input unless the empty set is given a cast, like in 32 or 64. Add an in 64, okay. Um, invalid error, operator, union cannot, yeah, because we don't know the type because we just gave it empty. So I'll do in 32 because I want, like to break the rules. Cool. That's dope. Also, I love these little runners for testing these things in line here. Super cool. You get the idea. They, they've handled this well. They've thought it through, and they've even made docs where you can play with it yourself. 
So nice. SQL support, reusable schemas, set-based, protocol auto-recovery. Oh, a Raisin tuple is being built in at a database level is so nice. I've done so much stupid shit with arrays. Ugh, so many nice things that they've snuck into this release. I am hyped. EdgeDB looks genuinely really exciting. I've been keeping an eye on them for a while, so much so that I'm now an advisor. I'm excited to see what they do, but that's just me. I'm curious what you guys think, especially since you're not officially advisors of the company. So let me know in the comments, is EdgeDB exciting, scary, different, weird, whatever? Let us know. I'll be sure the CEO sees all of your comments because he wants to know this feedback too. Let me know what you guys are thinking. Until next time, peace nerds.